Hi class. I thought I'd talk to you today about the alphabet of sounds from Mary Oliver. I think this is very, very important in approaching poetry because there are many different ways that we can seek out understanding or meaning from a poem. And too often people jump to the conclusion that there has to be a narrative in poetry and that I have to dis discern that narrative and describe it and I need to engage with the narrative as I see it in the poem. And there's a rush to make that kind of hard meaning. And what the alphabet of sounds allows us to do is to recognize partially or fully that there is another mode, another whole layer of quote-unquote meaning that arises out of a poem, and that is kind of, it's not really meaning, though. It's more like a, um, a, an experience with sound, and that that alone suffices for understanding what poetry does. So I don't want to demean or... or or diminish the idea of meaning that we normally associate with that word meaning, but I do want to include this other kind of experience that poetry can be. And Mary Oliver's Alphabet of Sounds allows for that. Okay, so let's go over this together. And I'd like us to be able to recognize some of these things when we encounter them in poetry and to realize the richness of language in and of itself. The sounds of the American and English alphabet may be divided into two general classes, she says, vowels and consonants. The vowels are simple, really. A vowel can make a perfect sound um, without any other letter involved. And that's why singers, we sing on vowel sounds. Oh, and E, right? All the vowels we can do that with. And that's why when singers are singing, we are hearing the vowel sounds predominantly, and then they're spliced in with consonants. So A, E, I, O, and U, and sometimes W, and sometimes Y, depending, um, are the only vowels. Everything else is a consonant. W is considered a vowel when it's um, after a vowel sound, like new, N-E-W, newly, um, dewy, eyebrow. Okay, it's after a vowel sound. Ow is a, uh, is a, is a vowel sound. Okay, so let's go to the consonants, though, because that's where all the work is. In an overview of the consonants, we have semi-vowels, we have aspirates, liquids, and mutes. Okay, so a semi-vowel is a consonant which can be imperfectly sounded without a vowel, so that at the end of a syllable, its sound may be protracted, as in L. Okay, in... I can extend, I can sustain this sound, which is similar to a vowel sound, right? The reason why I can do um, um, vocal exercises on O and E and A ah is because they can be protracted over time. So the semi-vowels are um, able to be imperfectly sounded but protracted. In the subcategory of semi-vowels, I have aspirates and liquids. Aspirates are sounds that can be protracted only as a breath. So F. In other words, they all degenerate into breath at some at the moment of enunciation. So um right? Um, H, H, um, J, 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 right? X, it all comes down to breath. 
liquids, which are talked about a lot more in poetry classes, L-M-N-R. These are sounds that are liquidy sounding because of the fluency of their sounds. L-M-N-R. L, mmm, right? We have meaning. We have direct meaning with that sound. Mmm, that was good. Or M&Ms, for instance. Um, and N and R. These sounds come up when there's a liquidy situation going on in a poem. So I'm writing my poem about the stream that my dog swims in. Automatically, without me attempting anything, there are going to be liquid sounds in that poem because I'm writing about water. And water will always come out with liquidy sounds. Um, if I'm writing about melting snow, if I'm writing about winter turning into spring, if I'm writing about swimming, if I'm writing about sex, if I'm writing about the way the sky appears to be a liquid sea when I come up over the hill. I want to keep these things in mind, be not because when I'm writing I'm going to go, oh, I'm writing a poem about the time my grandfather threw me into the pool when I was five. Automatically liquid sounds, right? I don't have to think about it, though. It's not as if I'm setting out to write L-M-N-R into, uh, into this poem. It happens automatically, but I have done the work prior. I have recognized that these are possible sounds that I could use in any given poem, and then therefore they're uh, available to me. They avail themselves to me when I am uh, writing my poem. Same with all the other sounds. So let's look at another category, a mute. So a mute sound is a consonant that cannot be sounded at all without a vowel and which at the end of the syllable suddenly stops the breath. K, K, P, P, T, T, K, uh, a acclaim. What an interesting word, acclaim. The C's in the word acclaim are actually K sounds. So let's think about sound as sound, not as spelling. So acclaim, a lot of it is, is vowel sounds. A, uh, A, M, and K are the consonant sounds. And isn't it interesting? Acclaim has that K sound cutting through it. But it also has that mmm sound at the end. We want a claim, mm, don't we? I mean, it's all, it's natural. And it's sort of a yummy sound. It's a yummy idea. I got a claim for the poems, poems I've written. It's a wonderful idea. <laughs> and invested or embedded in the sound of the word is the sense, or at least partially of the sense of that word, a claim. So for all of us to be on the alert when sounds are coming across and making meaning in their sounds. Okay, so we have these mutes and there are eight of them. B, D, K, P, Q, T, C, and G hard. Um, these sounds are often sounds that make us alert to the language. So think about all profanity, almost all profanity has a mute sound in it. And those words, right, fuck, is a great word in terms of it sounds like, you know, um, if, I'm, if I'm using it as an expletive, I missed the train, right? There is all of that energy of having um, missed my connection, not made it, I might be late, I'm harried, I feel anxious, all of it. And I would argue it's in that K sound. Even though we spell it with a CK, it's still just a K sound. So that's a mute sound. So as we're looking at poems, look at the language, at what the language is doing, at what it's sounding like. D and T are considered dental sounds because they're produced by touching the tongue to the top of the teeth. 
L in W. Um, and so what we have here and what Mary Oliver gets at at the end of this little sheet that I've provided is words not only a definition have not only a definition and a possible connotation, but they also have a felt quality of sound. That to me is gold in poetry. Can I write with a felt quality in the sound? Yes, I want to have definitional meaning involved. Yes, I want to have connotations involved. And connotations have to do with my own understandings of words based on my experience. So if I grew up in a forest, the word forest is entirely different than if I grew up in Los Angeles. And that's connotation. Denotation is dictionary meaning. So as we're thinking about language and going forward in the class, think about the complexity of these things. There's the definitional meaning forest, you know, um, a span, a space of trees and different uh, rock formations can be involved or what have you, right? Forest, dictionary meaning. Forest, my connotations, we would always go upstate or we would always go um, cut down our own Christmas tree in the forest, a pine forest, every year when I was a kid. How fantastic. The smell of pine, the feel of snow in my mittens and on my hands and on my face when me and my brother were throwing snowballs at each other and the laughter and the hot chocolate afterwards and um, being somewhere new and just trudging around and being silly and rolling around, right? All of that is involved in connotation for me versus New York, growing up in New York City and buying a Christmas tree on 6th Avenue, right? <laughs> Which is a very different experience. I've done both. So we have these definitional meanings. We have these connotational meanings. And then we also have sound. And sound gets left out too much. And without it, we don't have poetry. Thanks for listening.